Past players, past legends, past legends. And welcome to our past players, past legends, and in this case, uh, past CEO of the AFL, Mr. Wayne Jackson. Thank you very much for joining us, Wayne. It's a pleasure, Peter. Malcolm, no How worries. You? How are you, Wayne? Good, Malcolm. Thank you. So, Wayne, let's you know we'll go back to the beginning. Beginning, obviously, you know, starting starting off, uh, you know, son of Morris and Alice, uh, siblings Grant and John. Um, Starting off, also, I reckon one of the first most interesting points of you is, is, and you always make a mention this helped you in life, about uh, your father running a bakery and working in it. Wayne? Yeah. Yeah. Dad and his brothers owned a bakery in Cogham Street, Brompton, and um, um, uh, I think they had about 25 rounds, you know, horses and vehicles and um, probably 30 or 40 employees in the bakery and whatever. And um, when I went to um, that school and most of my mates went off mucking around for a year or two, I was dad said, you're coming straight to the bakery. And so I was working night shift there with some terrific fellows, but it was all night shift work. And night shift guys are a little bit unusual and or a little bit different, I think. And um, I just um, learned a lot from... Their, from them, the, their lives, um, um, their earthiness. Um, and I did that for a number of years, be, uh, each school holidays or um, subsequently university holidays. So I spent quite a number of years, probably three or four years, uh, doing night shifts in a bakery for about three months each year. What uh, what school did you uh, attend as a young fellow before you started to uh, head to work in the bakery, mate? Yeah, I went to Allenby Gardens Primary School, um, and then I was lucky enough to go to PAC, and um, that's where the schooling took place. When uh, when you obviously at Allenby Gardens, a pretty strong footy program there. Yeah, there was actually. Um, um, it was a very strong footy school. A guy, the headmaster was a guy called Mr. Dempster, and he was very keen on footy. And a guy called Freddie Bills, who I know would be well known to you guys, was, yeah, he was a year or two older than me, and he lived in Flinders Park, which is where we lived. And um, um, my parents were both great admirers of Fred, as I subsequently was, and he sort of took me under his wing a little bit. And... Um, uh, I was lucky enough when I was at primary school to um, play in the state um, Sapsars, what was called Sapsars, the team then, with a couple of guys that went on to play league footy too, Trevor Jakes and people like that. And um, of course, Trevor, um, so Trevor, that was... Trevor Jakes, of course, the Nord fitness guru. Mm. And, uh, yes. Oh, oh, well, all the stars came from Nord. Yes. All yes. the stars are from Nord now, can were they? Ray Wolford, I noticed as well there with Jacko. Ray Wolford was in the team, and uh, Chris Hunter, I think, played for Glenelg. Um, so there were probably half a dozen guys there that, um, at primary school under 12s, that uh, subsequently went on to play league footy in South Australia. Pretty pretty handy, that's for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. If they did a state uh, schools. Uh, you guys would have been well and truly up there, I imagine. Yes, yeah. But essentially, when I was, you know, my secondary school, we um, we had a guy called Chester Bennett yeah. was our coach there, which, which is well known to yeah. who is well man. known to you guys at cricket and football, and mm-hmm. you know we had guys like Peter Morton, Peter Darley was a superstar, um, Mark Skinner. Um, uh, one of the Hannafords, so we had a pretty strong schoolboys team there too, which was great. And that, that was at uh, PAC, yeah? Yeah, it was. And and if I could go on with that just a minute, Peter, um, I then went on to play at university where Alan Greer was the coach. And um, the first two years there, we won two premierships and we had guys like Dudley Hill um, from North Adelaide, Doc Clarkson, who's a State player from Sturt, Alan Byers from, from North Adelaide. Jan Hooper was the rover from West Adelaide. Um, Gambling was a halfback flanker from North Adelaide. Um, twinkle we had Toes. Probably, yeah, Twinkle Toes Gambling, yep. Um, so we had, 
you know, probably eight or nine guys in that university team, which um, Alan Greer coached and um, um, and that went on to play league footy, which was great. Of course, John Sankster and Keg Ferguson. So Bubba listens to our podcast oh, from yeah. London. So Bubba yeah. would have had a crack at me if I'd uh, hadn't missed if I'd missed Keg out. Look, also yeah, let's go well, back quickly back to Prince's and, and Chester Bennett. You know, he had an incredible influence on just so many people, and I reckon. No surprise that Ian Chappell, as usual, puts things pretty correctly and succinctly, that his line was, Chester was a wise man in sport and a wiser man in life. And I reckon that probably just nails... He was an amazing man, Chester Bennett. Yes, he was. Well, as a student, of course, we didn't know too much about life in those days. Um, but he he was a wonderful um, mentor as a coach and... You can't say a friend, I guess, as a as a teacher and a student, but you just felt that um, you know he was a little bit different um, in terms of what he contributed to the development and well being of individuals. Both cricket, I didn't get involved with cricket, obviously Ian and many others did, but with football, he he was just someone you really really respected and learned a lot from, and and there must have been scores, if not hundreds of. Yeah. students over the years would have that would have not dissimilar views. Because at uh, your career at Adelaide Uni, that you won an award, and I've got to, I've, it would be sacrilegious if I didn't mention this, Wayne, because it's something that I've got in common with an AFL CEO, the club le- <laughs> club letters, uh, Jacko. Yes. Yeah. Well, they were. Sorry. Club letters too for people out there. It's an award at uni. It's for on and off field. It's probably more off field than on-field in terms of that. And probably the amusing part about it, you get presented as a you know, a frame certificate. Uh, my wife, Emma, was always really dark because the club letters looked a hell of a lot better than her degree. So there was always a bit of amusement <laughs> about that, that how, how flashy it was. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of us, and you're one, Malcolm, that, um, you know, we tried pretty hard when we went across the white line, but, uh, we also tried to contribute to the the club as well, and uh, and you know uh, I, I think there's a lot of ki- kids or young people that do that today, but probably not enough. Um, yes, because they're so preoccupied with other things, Malcolm. But I'm down at a place called um, Willowlooka at the present time, which is in the upper southeast, and um, and just the community spirit down here with hockey clubs, cricket clubs, uh, etc. is just fantastic and it's all about what the volunteers do and the, yeah. um, and a lot of them are older but there are some younger guys coming through that are starting to understand that communities, football clubs, um, they need um, help and um, so many are starting to do that I think. Of course it'd be, uh, I'd get into a bit of trouble with a few uni people mentioning you also got a full blue, now that is the distinguished part of of on field, it's at standing performance as a player in particular sport mm. while studying at uni. Now they're they're not giving out lightly full blues, and you you're no, a proud recipient not, of that. No, they're not. And the other thing I was really proud of there, uh, Malcolm, there's the the amateur. Uh, I think it was called the amateur sports club at that stage. Yes. They used to give a uh, a medal for someone that's you know done a bit on field and done a bit off field. And one year I was lucky enough to win that too. So it's all about you know as you well know it's about giving a little bit back and trying like hell when you're on the footy field. And um, one, Wayne, one other point now I think as we move on to the West Torrens side of things, it's quite amusingly you better give us the fill in that you could well have been a blood, not an eagle. <laughs> We, um, when I was, when we were 18, we moved, my family, uh, mum and dad and our kids moved from um, Grange Road, Flinders Park to Strathmore Avenue, Lockleys, and we ended up living next to Ozzy O'Grady, uh, who was, um, you know, well known as a long-term president uh, of the West Orange Football Club. And when he understood that what I was doing at um um, playing at uni and living in the West Adelaide district, which Lockleys was at that stage, he arranged for me to play one game in the under 19s for West Torrens um, before the term expired um, uh, for my qualification. So I played one game for 
West Torrens, so I didn't have to play for West Adelaide. And uh, when I finished at uni three years later, well, I was tied to West Torrens, which I was just so thrilled about because we're life, lifelong supporters of the West Torrens Football Club, Peter. So, obviously, um, talking about uh, your time at uni, what, what, what subjects did you uh, study while you were there? Um, I did economics. Um, so that was supposed to be a three-year program. I took, I did, uh, I think I got eight, 11, eight subjects out of 11 after the three years, and then I did the last couple of subjects part-time. Uh, and after I graduated with um, economics, I did um, uh, a degree in accounting as well. So and at those stages, it was um, pretty strong you know, commercial background or commercial training, I should say. Mm-hmm. And this was all while you were uh, playing at West Torrance? Yeah, yeah, playing at West Torrance and uh, and then getting married and having three kids and doing all that sort of stuff. So my wife, Liz, um, you know, made a magnificent contribution. And so, give us, you know, your time at West Torrance, it's, you know, you played 140, just over 140 games, which ironically are virtually split, 70-odd leagues, yeah. 70-odd reserves. Yeah. Now, it's quite ridiculous of everything you did at West Torrens, Wayne. In fact, I think it's actually a bit pathetic you didn't run the canteen as well as well while you were there because you did everything else. Well, there's so, still time, mate. Yeah, yeah. President, you know, um, on the committee, uh, ended up... Runner. Yeah, runner, co- yeah. coaching the reserves, and then, of course, ended up coaching the league side. Give us give us yeah. a bit of a rundown of all your time at West Torrens, Wayne. Well, that that's right. Um, um I played about 53 or 4 games straight, so I guess I started to think, you know, I probably thought I was a bit better than I was, actually. But in the end, played about 70 league games and 70 reserve games. And when I went to Melbourne, they used to say to me, oh, how many games did you play at West Times? And I said, I played 140, 70 in the seconds and 70 in the league. But they never wrote about the, the reserves. They just said I played 140 games at West Times, which blew my bags up more than they should have been blown up. So, um, um, at, in the end of the career in those days, um, a couple of the more experienced guys would um, not retire straight away, but go back and play in the reserves for a year or two to help the young kids, which I did. And um, um, in, I ended up um, coaching the reserves, and then Billy Barrett was appointed coach of um, the league side, and that didn't really work out. We all learnt a lot from Bill, but it didn't. We didn't um, work out uh, as well as it should have. And um, um, so I coached for uh, two thirds of a season, and we did pretty well. We made the finals. Um, and the interesting part is, that I think I've told Malcolm this before. Um, when I finished coaching that, that year. They, uh, the committee said, oh, well, please, you'll coach next year. Obviously, I said, no, I'm not going to coach next year. Um, I've got a wife, I've got kids, I've got um, Thomas Hardy and sons to think about. And um, they said, well, what about coaching the reserves again? And I said, no, I don't want to do that either because that's not fair on the incoming league coach because if he loses three or four in a row, the spec to the um, the what the members will start to say, you know, bring back last year's coach, which was me. Um, and so I, I said, no, I'm not going to do that either. Thank you. And they said, well, what about coming on the committee? I said, oh, you, oh well, yeah, I'm come, I'll come on the committee. That's okay. Um, so I joined the committee and went to my first meeting. And I don't know what happened, Peter and Malcolm, but at that first meeting, I was elected chairman. And... Um, and a guy called Bruce Harrison, who was the company secretary of Albert Del Fabro, was our treasurer, a very competent treasurer. And he said to me, look, Wayne, I've got to see you after the meeting. So um, um, the meeting finished. And I said, OK, Bruce, what do you want? He said, well, I just thought I'd better tell you, we're broke. I said, well, what do you mean we're broke? He said, well, you know what I mean. When we're broke, we can't pay the players. We can't pay our creditors. Um so that was a, a real eye opener, and uh, for the first time, our footy club. Then uh, we did a three-year plan, a budget, and a three-year plan. I took it to the National Bank of Finland, and um, uh, the banking manager eventually said, "Yeah, look, we'll loan you the money uh, 
for the three-year period. He said, but it's conditional upon you staying as chairman of the club and implementing the plans that you presented to us. And I said, well, look, I can't do that because I'm elected by the members and they may not re-elect me in two years' time. He said, we don't care what the members do. Uh, we're loaning you the money conditional upon you staying there for three years. Well, I did get re-elected. I stayed there three years and we worked our way out of um, you know, an awful financial position to one of some reasonable strength. West Torrance, do you wonder... West Torrens really, you know, the fact that Woodville came in, if, if that hadn't happened, West Torrens would still, would still be around on its own right now, do you suspect? Well, I, I don't know, Malcolm, um, or Peter, I'm not sure who that was, but I I actually supported the club um, merging with yep. um, Woodville. Um, and, you know, I think it's been one of the few a really successful mergers in probably Australian football. Um, um, I don't know whether they would have been, we would have been around because it was needed a lot of help from the SAFL and other clubs to get jealous. And yep. you just, you just don't know. But I think in the end, the right decision was made, in my opinion. And I think too, it's it spot on in terms of it's an amalgamation where quite often amalgamation is really a takeover. Yep. You know, like yeah. Brisbane effectively took over Fitzroy. We'll yep. have those last few players. Yeah. Sydney took and over. The Swans South took Melbourne. over yeah. South Melbourne. The Swans yeah. took over South Melbourne, yeah. So, yeah. This I, was I a coming together, together. of both, yeah. both clubs that needed uh, that little bit of help along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And guys like Bill Sanders uh, um, and Rex Sellers from the Eagles, Bill Sanders from... Woodville, I mean, they acted in good faith and I think did a terrific job in the end, yeah. And Wayne, so go through your, your working career, you know, before the AFL and all that, because it's pretty fascinating as well. You've, you've had some very responsible roles, you know, with Hardys, etc. and West End. Give us a rundown there. Well, after leaving uni, I worked for three years at Deloitte, so I didn't enjoy accounting at all. And um, then I joined Hardy's and uh, I was there for 25, 26 years and you know, went through the company secretarial bit and general manager. Then I was managing director, I think, for 10 years. Um, and then we got uh, merged with BRL to become BRL Hardy. Yep. And after a couple of years there, I was headhunted to go to the South Australian Brewing Company, where I was um, managing director for three years and very happily happy there. And then in 1992-ish, uh, I was headhunted to go to the AFL and had, um, uh, well, I had a year or so as the, um, on the commission as a non-executive and then seven to eight years as a CEO, which I loved. Uh, it, was, it, was a, uh, it was a terrific job. So my whole life, Malcolm and Peter, or most of my working life, has been in wine and beer and football, and that's not all that bad. Can't argue with that. No. I reckon that's probably a tick tick <laughs> tick off uh, most people's preferences there, Wayne. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Now, in terms yeah. of being headhunted by the AFL and all that, you, you had done some other administration back in South Australia as well, other than the Eagles. So, trying to remember yes, in that I had. regard, well, yeah. Yeah, I was on the I was the director of the SAFL, and then one of the um, commissioners. So when then the directorships moved to a, then the SAFL formed a commission under Max Bash here and Lee Wicker and whatever. And I was one of four or five uh, commissioners. Uh, really, really enjoyed that. And then I was on, um, I really enjoyed also, we, we formed a retention committee when there was some uh, probability of the um, South, of a South Australian team going into the um, AFL, uh, we formed what was called a retention committee. So there were four or five of us, including Jack Odie and, uh, and Rick Allett and Peter yep. Page and myself. And our job was to try and influence um, the players that we wanted to retain to stay in South Australia. And we were very, and we raised money through sponsorship, um, et cetera, and were very successful in keeping, you know, the great bulk of the players we wanted to. We missed out on one or two, like Darren Jarman, um, but we um, did retain the McDermott's and the um, Bickley's and the Bubners and um, the Wrens and those sort of people who became, you know, uh, the backbone of the original crow. Yeah, and 
you know, it, the Crows, as we know, form, form Messi and all that. But let's keep going with the... So now you you started off at the at the AFL. Go there, Wayne. Well, uh, so it's, um, a, a guy called John Winnicky was on the uh, AFL commission, and he had to retire because he uh, got a job um, in the Supreme Court, and he was concerned about conflicts of interest. So he retired from the commission. So there's a casual vacancy, and uh, Bob Hammond rang me once. I was actually in uh, Europe and rang me and said, look, we'd like to nominate you for the commissioner, to, to the commission as a non-executive to replace John Winnicke. And I thought about that, and I thought, well, that would be a bit of fun. So I accepted that, and I got uh, got put on the commission. Then I had to go up to the the next AGM um, and, and be voted in, because whilst you could appoint a commissioner when there's a casual vacancy, uh, you then had to submit yourself to the... Uh, for the other clubs to be elected the following year, which I did uh, and was elected. Um, so I was in, you know, in my basically a second year as a non-executive commissioner. And then um, Ross Oakley uh, announced he was going to retire and um, 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 a, a small committee was elected to um, find his replacement. I wasn't one of those. And... Um, we all agreed as a commissioner commission that only the chairman, who was uh, John Kennedy, uh, would make any uh, comment on the process of uh, appointing a new CEO. So that went on for some months. And um, we used to get a report at the commission level to, of the progress being made. And one day I was at home and the, uh, the firm doing the, um, the, the charge with the responsibility of, of nominating a, a, a CEO rang me and said, look, we want to talk to you. And I said, look, you can't talk to me. You have to talk to the chairman. He's the only one authorised to talk. They said, oh, no, no, you can talk. I said, no, I'm sorry, you can talk to the chairman. And then they said, well, we want to talk to you about you doing the job. I thought, oh, well, gee whiz, that's a bit different. <laughs> so I was 53 years of age and chatted at length to my wife. And we decided, well, look, if we're ever going to do something really different, um, now's the time to do it. So um, I was successful in getting that job and started in 1996 after three years in the brewery and um, absolutely loved our time in Melbourne and, um, and, and enjoyed the job very much. Well, 1995, he goes on as a casual vacancy, and by 1996, you're running the whole joint, mate. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> you may That's have right. had a master well, stroke. It was on... unusual for South, unusual yeah. for South Australian, yes. of course, because when you met the press over there, they, they were disbelieving that a, a, a non-Victorian could possibly run the AFL. What yeah. could you possibly know about football? You know. Yes. Uh, yes. So anyway, that, we proved them wrong, hopefully. You may have had a bit of a master stroke on who you said you barrack for in uh, on AFL Grand Final <laughs> Day in '96, Wayne. Yeah, well, the first interview, um, uh, the point of Grand Final Day, nineteen ninety six, was it? I yep. think it was. Yep. And um, so the, we're doing the press interview. John Kennedy's on my left, and we've got all these journo's there in front with flashing bulbs and microphones and asking questions and. That went on for quite some time. And the last question was, somebody said to me, oh, who do you barrack for? And I, I you know, immediately the, the alarm bells went off with me. And I said, um, I barrack for Fremantle. And um, because at that stage, Fremantle was so motherless last, they were broke, people wanted them out of the competition. And I said, they said, Fremantle? I said, yeah, it's Fremantle. Straight as a, with a straight face. <laughs> well, then they left me alone. I mean, they all felt sorry for me, and never ever did I get, you know, accused of anything because I barracked for Fremantle. Thank goodness, because the following year, the Crows won the premiership, and then won it again the year after that. And I, and I, I mean, the mind boggles, Peter and Malcolm, as to what the press would have had to say yeah. if they knew I was a Crows supporter and the Crows won two premiers. Every decision we made. They'd be looking at saying, yeah. "Well, how does this impact on the crows?" You know, yep. so they were known for doing a, that anyway. True story. Yeah, pardon? They're known for doing that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Okay, yeah. right. Um, so, go through your responsibilities and what you felt were your achievements and, and that side of things in the role, Wayne. 
Well, when, when I took it on, we were we were, had real problems with the, our relationship with the media. Um, I mean, for example, Ross had been there 10 years and, in my view, did a terrific job. But we were at loggerheads with people like Patrick Smith, who at that stage was the football writer for the age. Um, so we had a lot of mending to do in terms of our relationship with the um, with the press. But as I got into the job, um, you know, there are other issues like, um, and the major one probably was the uh, what we're we going to do with Waverley because anyone that was any sort of reasonableness could understand that Waverley was a long way from the yeah. city. It was in a rain belt. It had never been completed. There's no public transport, uh, and yet we're still trying to prop it up. But in the end, we, the commission, decided we'd have to sell it and do something else, uh, and that was my job. Um, and at the same time, to his great credit, and Jeff Kennett, the Premier of Victoria, um, decided to um, um, develop what's called the Docklands, which are basically walls and marshes and um, uh, not a very um, uh, attractive place. And that he wanted to build a, um, a stadium there for soccer and rugby. And we were able to convince him that um, to build a stadium in Melbourne, the city of Melbourne, and not cater for Australian football was just crazy. Yep. So after a little while, uh, like months, uh, we convinced the government that, that it had to be based on Australian football. And um, the government gave us the land. Uh, we put down $30 million, which we got from the sale of our broadcasting rights um, with Channel 7 and in return for playing I think it was 35 if not 37 games a year there for 25 years that stadium became the um, the uh, under the ownership of the AFL with no restrictions at all so it was a freehold title uh, for 25 years incredible deal really playing, mm. yeah simply for playing 35 to 37 games a year. Well, as you know, um, partway through that 25 years, um, the AFL decided that they wanted to buy it, which they did, and uh, redeveloped and that stadium's now probably worth in the order of a billion dollars. Yeah. And, um, and it's now arguably um, the best football stadium in the country to watch football in. We've got over all the issues. Remember the issues of oh, the hard yes, surface yeah, and the yeah. players complaining yeah. and the, yeah. and all of that. All that's gone, and um, it's just a terrific stadium now under the full ownership of the AFL. And as well, of course, the AFL has got its offices there on its own freehold land. So it's been a, a, a tremendous boon for the game. Well, yeah, I, I personally can't believe the criticism it gets. Um, you know, no, not now. But you know, like, in, in Hardwick Earth, still carries Earth. on like a pork chop about it. And, you know, Damien Hardwick, and yeah, you know, I just, I still don't get. I think it's a great ground, personally. So, yeah. yeah. Well, Damien Hardwick carries on because he wants to play all his games at the MCG. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the poor old, poor old Richmond. They've only got about seventeen or eighteen games at the yeah. MCG, so he doesn't want to play it at um, at the Marvel Stadium because his team hasn't got the same advantage it's got when it plays at um, Melbourne. And that's one of the issues the AFL, of course, has to work through. So you get a club like Richmond, and if there's 23 games a year, and if they play five or six games in the state, they're left with 17 or 18 yeah. games. Well, Hardwick wants all those played at the MCG. The AFL says, well, look, when you play Fremantle or, yeah, um, exactly. or Gold Coast, you can play them at the Marble Stadium. But he's, um, some clubs are still not happy with that, but that's the way it's got to be. Well, such a long way to travel for you know Richmond. It's at least five <laughs> or six k's. You know, so come on. Yeah, Speaking of right. traffic, mate, it's yeah. always yeah. always tough, yeah. uh, mate. Uh, you obviously um, oversaw a couple of mergers and relocations. D- did you find that your time with Woodville West Torrens helped you with a bit of insight with that? Um, no, well, I, I wasn't involved administratively when that. Woodville West Torrens thing happen. Uh, it's like all. It's like I mean, it's, if you've had a bit of experience in business, um, you understand that you know you've got to 
you've got to take people with you. you you've got to leave things on the table for the other party. Um, the, um, the Brisbane thing happened my first year there, but then Port came in, which um, um, Port Power came in uh, to the AFL, but that wasn't a, a merger, but that was a difficult time for the AFL and for the Port Adelaide Football Club. Um, um, but in, no, in, what, in what in what way for Port Adelaide? I mean, obviously, we know here in South Australia the the struggles that they had with um, the Crows being accepted before they were. But yeah. from an AFL point of view, uh, a little bit difficult there as well. Well, I, I think from the sense that Port was such a strong club in Adelaide that the, you know, the, with respect, they thought they knew it all. Um, and coming into the AFL, um, the AFL wasn't going, and other clubs, of course, weren't going to respond to the, necessarily respond to the way Port wanted to do things. So they they found it very hard for a, a couple of years. I mean, in the end, got well on track, but there, there's also always a little bit of angst between the the, the uh, AFL and um, and Port. And there was a little bit between the AFL and the SAFL too, because the SAFL was, you know, regard themselves as the second strongest competition. It took them a long time, as you well know, for uh, the SAFL to accept that the AFL was here to stay and was going to manage football around the whole of the country. Um, So um, uh, those things take time, but with goodwill on all parts, you, you, you eventually find a way through. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating thing. And look, personally, you know, ten, it's meant to be an AFL competition where I still see it personally as an extended VFL. You know, the relocation yeah. it would have been great. I I think both North Melbourne and either St Kilda Western Bulldogs, someone else, it should be spread around. You know, I think one of those teams should have relocated to Tasmania as well. North Melbourne should have gone to the Gold Coast, in my opinion. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, and that. It would give more of an Australian feel than an extended v- VFL competition, yeah. personally. Yeah, well, Malcolm, I, I agree totally that the, there should have been a team from uh, Melbourne relocated to the uh, Gold Coast, and that should have been North Melbourne. But um, Brayshaw, Brayshaw took over from somebody who was the president. He was going to solve all the problems of North yeah. Melbourne, and there was very anti them going to the Gold Coast, I think. And I, um, I think the AFL offered North Melbourne a hundred million dollars to relocate. Now I don't know that for sure, but that's that's what um, touted, uh, and they still said no. Um, it's an extraordinary decision, a, really. Yeah, a bizarre. Yeah, and of course it's too late now yeah. because with the club having the with the AFL having the funds, it can prop these these clubs up. And of course there should be a team in uh, Tasmania. Yes. And, and in my view, um, the you know a team should be relocated. I don't think that there'll be a relocated team. I think with a little bit of luck, they'll play you know eight, nine, ten games down there, eleven games down there, maybe twelve, and a few in Melbourne and a few around the rest of the country. Yeah, I just think it should have been an amalgam, another team though, in terms of going down to Tasmania. I know yeah. Tasmania are against that, but let's remember Sydney or South Melbourne. Everyone forgets that nowadays. That's Sydney. And I think the same thing yeah, would have ha- right. the same thing would have yeah. happened in Tasmania. And I just think it's still c- crazy that there's ten teams in Victoria. You know, I just... Yeah, well, well, mate, we all do, um, but it's uh, it's not easily resolved. Um, but I mean, the reality is, if you tried um, Malcolm to relocate, say, um, the Western Bulldogs down to um, Hobart. Um, and they objected to it. You'd find, you know, the, the Carlton supporters would march in the street, and the Collingwood yeah, supporters would yeah. march in the street. Yeah. So you, you wouldn't uh, be very, very hard to uh, to um, to bring about. But but I do think there's going to be more AFL footy played in Tasmania and um, probably Hobart. Uh, but they do have to get an undercover stadium. I mean, how can you play mm. AFL footy down there in the middle of winter? Um, yeah. Yeah, um, so there's a lot of, uh, I'm sure it's a high priority for Gillan McLaughlin, but there's a lot, a lot of water to pass under that bridge. I would have thought. With with the Melbourne Hawthorne merger, how far advanced 
were they down the track? I mean, well, that that was the year before I was on the uh, commission then, but not not the chief executive. So, yep. Um, but you would have heard a few things going on that. that... Oh yeah, well, it's, well, it's just like we're saying the, uh, you know, the Melbourne supporters probably felt that they've got to do something, and uh, the, and the Hawthorne people thought, well, we don't want to merge. So, yeah. you, you know, the Don Scott thing's famous now for the burning yeah. of the Guernsey yeah. uh, and all of that. Um, but I don't think it ever got rid. Re- when they had the vote, it didn't. It wasn't close. So. And maybe in retrospect, um, uh, that proved to be right because Hawthorne went from strength to strength and Melbourne's now a very uh, well-managed and competitive footy club. So that's probably, you know, uh, worked out all right. Yeah, but, true. Um, that doesn't mean there shouldn't be somebody down in Hobart. Yeah. Or uh, Northern Territory. Can you see a team being up there at some stage as well? No, I, I can't. I, ca- I can't see that. Um, um, I mean, I just... You can't see how it fits in weather-wise, yes. um, how you get people to live up there and train for 10 months a year in Darwin. Um, I think that's a very different um, situation. I mean, the Indigenous guys have done wonderful things for all of the footy clubs, but I can't see a, a team up there, um, yeah, not in my lifetime anyway. Could a South Australian or WA third side come about at some stage? Well, the, the problem is that we've, we've now got 18 teams and um, you know, if you start adding one in Tasmania, that makes 19 if you don't relocate somebody. Yep. And then you're starting to think about, well, we've got a 19, 18, 19, 20 team competition. Maybe we should have two divisions. And in one division, you know, obviously you've got Port and, and West Coast and Sydney and Brisbane and the other one, you've obviously got the Crows and Fremantle and the GWS and, um, and and the Gold Coast, you know, so you've got one from each team in the competition. And when you start to think about, well, maybe they play each other twice mm. uh, in that division and then once they play a team in the other division and at the end of the, world, end of the year, the, the division leaders, top three or four from each um, division, they play off for the finals. That, that could be... Um, that could be well be worthwhile considering and thinking about over a period of time. Yeah, it'd be and interesting. There'd think... be plenty of argy bargy on which teams are going to which division, and yeah, oh, but yeah. that could rotate yeah. around yeah. over a course of uh, eight or nine years. Maybe. Yeah, mm. you could. I mean, if you've got say uh, ten team in each division, well, maybe after two years, the bottom three swap over to the other three, other division. Who knows? But uh, I, I think, I think. Having a 20, for example, a 20-team uh, competition gets gets messy because if you have 22, 23, 24 games, you're playing everyone once and a couple of teams twice. So um, uh, I, I'm sure, you know, the strategic thinkers within the AFL would, would have on their plates, um, you know, have we or do we have a um, two divisions sometime in the future? And the AFL reserves comp look it nearly happened years ago. Um, you know the teams were told to prepare for it and everything, and then it fell away. And it's it's a little bit now. COVID's obviously happened and that sort of thing. So that's one as well. Look, it's, it's ironic the debate on whether you know the Crows and Port should be in the SNFL or not. And just trying to explain to people that it's not just the the fifty thousand dollars what the Crows put in. You've then got the stadium management deal on how much money goes back to the clubs, and that's always argy bargy. The TV side of things and all that, it's not just, a, it is so ridiculously complicated on whether the Crows and Port can be in the SNFL or not that people just have no idea how complicated it is, Wayne. And trying to explain it to a few people today, it's, yeah, I, I it, it's. Well, I, I agree with it. I agree with it. It is complicated. Oh. Um, and similarly, like having a national reserves competition is, is just nonsense to Malcolm because it costs just as much to put reserve players on aeroplanes yeah. and put them in hotels and uh, and have the appropriate staff as it does to have an AFL uh, team. So the cost of having a national uh, reserves competition is ludicrous. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not and, quite so. I'm not quite. I, I certainly understand in that way and the cost. In, in, and that, but 
on how much money the game generates. Like it's a multi, they're multi million dollar corporation. You know, franchises. They're not footy clubs and and all that in the old sense. So yeah, I'm not. I still think that'll end up happening, but yeah, we'll wait and see. So what, a national competition for the reserve? Yeah, I think so. so uh, that, I think you're more likely to find Malcolm. The Cairns and uh, Townsville, yeah, and, possibly, yeah, um, true. They'll, they'll, and Brisbane and Darwin and you know North New South Wales, they'll get together, uh, and maybe we in Adelaide will get together. You know, who knows? It's Tasmania or yeah. Northern Territory or somebody. True. I don't know. Yeah, right. yeah. So, when... yeah, but but a lot of a lot of people at the AFL um, would be thinking about these issues. Yeah. So when. In terms of, are there any, are there any things on, in retrospect you would have done differently in, in your role as CEO? Anything, um, anything you'd like to change, apart from North Melbourne, obviously, going? Um, going. <laughs> um, no, I'm not, not a great one for looking back. I mean, it, you always make mistakes, but uh, I don't think we made any strategic no. mistakes. Um, um, it's interesting, one of the things that I was never able to do was to get the preliminary final played in the home state, the state that's won the right to host yeah. it because they, we've got this long-term agreement with the MCG. Um, but um, uh, and Andrew Dimitri was able to do that, but he did, but he did it by just giving the MCG another Collingwood Essendon game to replace the, you know, we used to argue, look, what's the point of having a preliminary final the MCG if the Crows are playing um, Brisbane? You know, yeah. you'll, yeah. you, 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 um, so uh, we had to uh, find a way of re- um, giving the um, MCG the same uh, capacity to um, generate the income to, to do that. Well, I was never able to do that. It's happened now, which is good. But the, uh, mm-hmm. I, I am disappointed that we the uh, grand final is committed to, I think yeah. it's 2057 yeah. 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 now. And, and that's Ridiculous. done, of course. Oh. Well, uh, yeah, Excellent. it's done to underwrite the uh, infrastructure costs of uh, developing yeah. the MCG. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we used to, it used to be out to 35, which I thought was a long time, but 57, the mind boggles. And I'm sure something will change in the next number of years now, so I don't know what it will be, but nothing nothing lasts for 35 years, so um, something will happen. I will say personally, I always found Wayne to be balance, balanced. Um, he said quickly, you know, there was a lunch where Wayne was the guest speaker at uni one day, and I think he pretty realised within a couple of minutes that I was the footy nuffy in the room, and so we developed a relationship from then. I do remember one day as an you know, being on the committee with uni and we didn't have a problem with the SNFL and it actually involved Glenn, the late Glenn Rosser. And I said, mm. geez, you know, it was actually with you at a dinner at, at uh, West Adelaide Footy Club, you know, which the late Box Ravisi had organised. And mm. I, I said, Wayne, this blah, blah, blah. And you said, why don't you phrase it this way, Malcolm? And you immediately took out the confrontation and I always remember that. And I was sitting with Michael Dads and the two of us looked at each other and went, yeah, that's far better straight away. And, yeah, mm. I always found you to be the balance, really balanced in that regard. Personally, yeah, you can say I'm biased in that way. I think you're the gun official at CEO land and all that. So, I, I yes. think that it showed, uh, you know, obviously supporting the Western Bulldogs and North Melbourne through their toughest times, uh, mm. pretty mm. Uh, fair and balanced approach that uh, really helped them survive, really, at the end of the day. Yes, it did, yeah. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you for those comments, fellas. Yeah, and of course, Wayne, you, I think probably an interview with you, I'd, I'd, I'd find it negligent if you uh, didn't get the chance to give Liz a proper mention and your kids. Go for it, mate. Oh, well, um, well, my wife passed away three and a half years yep. ago and um, uh, and none of, it, none of what, if I'd been able to achieve anything in business or sport or whatever, none of it would have been possible without the support of Liz. Um and I guess by extension, um, three girls. So I'm very, very lucky with that. Um, most of us now, male or female, um, you take a team approach to things, don't you? Maybe we didn't do it as well in my early days as we should have, Malcolm. <laughs> but, but you learn. Yep. And, um, 
and I'm so appreciative of uh, you know the support I've had from Liz and my girls. So um, that's good. Thank you. What are you up to these days, mate? Uh, in your spare time, are you um, administrating well, uh, with any anything up, oh, up at Willaluga? This, this farm gets a fair hammering. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a, I've got a farm at Winnaluga, but uh, and I've had that for twenty four or five years. So we're just in the process of working out what we're going to do with that. But um, um, I still, you know, still on a couple of advisory board uh, advisory board or two. It's got good mates. All the things that seventy eight year old blokes dream about doing, Peter. So yep. um, um, yeah, life's pretty good. Thank you. Um, albeit. We're one short in the family, but never mind. Well, not never mind. Yeah. I can't do much about that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Look, greatly appreciated your time, Wayne. Uh, always value right your friendship Malcolm. and your advice. Greatly appreciated. Thanks, Wayne. Right on, Malcolm. Thank you. Thanks for your interest, and thank you, Peter, too. No, thank you for your insights, mate. That's absolutely fantastic. Okay. All the best, boys. Bye. Thanks, okay.